comes in the woods from the safety of my living room. <laughs> it's a beautiful scene. But can I tell you that nothing is more ferocious than a mother bear robbed of her cubs? You don't want to be that person. Nothing more tender and nothing more horrible than her being robbed of her cubs. She is the incarnation of purity and ferocity. God in His judgment aimed at more than just inflicting a wound to Israel. He aimed to kill Israel. And He did. Now God can be a shepherd to you. He can lead you by the still waters. He can. He wants to. Or God can be a ferocious bear robbed of her cubs. Both of these are God's character. Both are God's character. Both things are the holiness of God. But He deals with us as we need it. And if you want to be prideful and powerful, God said, I got a bear for you. <laughs> I got a bear for you. But if you want to be a sheep and just follow the shepherd, I got some cool water. Some steel streams. Some green meadows. Both fit into the holiness of God, but you and I make the choices. Both of these are right because the ways of the Lord are right. Your pride and your arrogance brings out the bear. But your humility, your mercy, walking humbly before the God, before the Lord God brings out the shepherd. So can I encourage you today to humble yourself? Please, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And He will exalt you. But God resists the proud. But gives grace to the humble. So let's humble ourselves today. And one of the reasons I believe God's hand is upon our church is because we are praying as much or more than we ever have. Amen. There's something about power in prayer. There's something about the men sitting down here every Sunday morning. You don't see them. I brag on them, but you don't see them. They pray over these pews. I come here some Sundays and they're walking down the pews, putting their hands on the pews, praying for you before you get here. I've seen them pray over this altar and over these instruments, over this choir. There's power in prayer. Those guys are humbly seeking the Lord because they want the shepherd. Amen. But you come in here with your pride and you can get the bear. But God says, walk humbly before me. Walk humbly before me. And I'm still saying, preacher, you preach on pride a lot. Yep. It's my glitch. It is my chink in my armor. And on a regular basis, Satan eats my lunch in this area. Because I think I'm humble. He says, okay. <laughs> and he beats the slop out of me. Now, that's probably not a good way to say it, church, is it? He comes against me in the powers of the forces of darkness, and he wins the battle. For those of you from South Georgia, he beats the slop out of me, okay? <laughs> you get it? And I have to get back on my knees again and say, Oh, God, how did I let pride creep up on me again? It's insidious. And it eats at us from the inside. You don't fall publicly. You fall privately when you're not walking with God day after day after day. It just shows up publicly. It shows up when you've embezzled from your corporation. It shows up when you run off with the secretary. It shows up when you burst forth in your anger and your hatred. But it happens in those quiet places. Because you just stop going because I got this, God. Everything's all right, God. Let me tell you, pride is killing me and pride is killing you. Whether you confess it or not. He is like the leopard lurking by the Killing the churches in Columbus. God, forgive us. Forgive me of my pride. God asked him. He says, where's the king that's going to save you? I mean, isn't that why we're voting? The president's going to save us? Right? Are we dependent on Congress to save us? Are we dependent on City Hall to save us? Somebody say no. We're dependent on the Lord God to save us. Amen. Where is your king that he may save you? The rulers in all your towns, of whom you said, Give me king and princess. So in my anger, I gave you what you asked for. And in my wrath, I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept. God's claim to be Israel's only savior condemns their habit of seeking other saviors. 
They look for deliverance from a king, from a military power, from a political alliance, from idols. None of them provided a Savior. You know why? Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which men must be saved. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only Savior for the world. And because He was willing to humble Himself, to leave heaven, to come and die on that cruel cross and be resurrected, the Bible says, Therefore, God has exalted Him to the highest place. You can't have it. He's already got it. To the highest place and given him a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, including Hillary and Donald. Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord, Amen. to the glory of God the Father. That's why we've got to be in church to the glory of God. Because it's about the glory of God. Israel's in trouble. The bear's coming. We've seen their power. We've seen their pride. Now look at their pains. Pains as of a woman in childbirth come to him. That he is the child without wisdom. When the time arrives, he doesn't have the sense to come out of the womb. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? I will have no compassion, even though... He thrives among his brothers. The east wind from the Lord will come, blowing into the, <coughs> excuse me, from the desert. His spring will fail and his well will dry up. His storehouse will be plundered and all of his treasures. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open. The pains of a woman in childbirth are sudden. They're irresistible. And sometimes they're violent. One moment, everything's fine, right? Next moment, time to go. All right, we, we get it. The onslaught of this is inevitable because of the pregnancy. But when the pains come, they oftentimes increase in intensity. If they fail to accomplish their purpose, mama and baby will die. That's why they're there. Israel's death pains were on the way. At this very moment, there was peace. Everything was fine. But Hosea said, you're pregnant. Delivery day is coming. And it came quickly for them. He said, you must repent. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? Now, that's in a very negative sense in Hosea here. Because right after that, God says, I'm not going to have any compassion on you. But Paul picks this up. And in 1 Corinthians, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he made it a very positive thing. He says, when the imperishable has been clothed with, excuse me, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And he adds this. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't end with the grave. Yesterday, Will Bergen did a great job. A great job. Memorializing his death. And can I tell you, if you've not buried your parents, you've got a sad day coming. A sad day coming. But I got hope for you. That's not the end if they know Jesus. That's not the end. Death has lost its sting. Because there's victory in Jesus. Why is this going to be a church against the Lord of God? Because there's victory in Jesus. That's what we need to know. Hosea said, An east wind from the Lord will come blowing in from the desert. His spring will fail and his well will dry. His storehouse will be plundered and all of his treasures. Israel had placed much of its emphasis for its security on its wealth. So we got money, we can buy an army. It had placed much of its emphasis on its idol worship. This golden calf was worshipped, and now it was going to be taken off by a victorious army as booty, as victory. 
for the army that conquered them. Just like the hot east wind blows in, he says, that's how Assyria is going to come in and it's going to devastate all of our resources. And then in verse 16, it's a horrible verse, Hosea simply reports what everybody knew to be true about the Assyrians. How they treated people. It's horrible. How they brutalized any population that resisted them at all. Their purpose was to deter any rebellion or retaliation. Hosea says God's judgment is coming just like the pain and delivery of a pregnant woman. It is coming. And you think, wow, how can it get any worse than this? Israel had forsaken her God. Then God, God brings judgment on the nation. Even the righteous people in that nation suffered judgment. Did you hear me? If and when God brings judgment on this great nation of ours, the righteous and the unrighteous will suffer alike. That's why we have to do something about it now. <coughs> you see, God took their precious land. God took their precious golden calf. God took their ability to make money. God took their industry. He tore their families apart member by member. And many watched the Assyrians kill men, women, and children brutally. So that's horrible. And it is. But thank God there's a chapter 14. Amen. Don't miss chapter 14. That's next time. There is hope. There is hope. Above the door of my office, before I walk out every day, I get to read this sign. And I believe that sign. That's my job. To remind you that because of Jesus, there's hope. The grave can't hold them. The hospital can't heal them. Jesus can do both. Amen. It's a matter of putting our hope and our faith and our trust in Him. I heard this a long time ago, but I like saying it. See, if you know Jesus, you have hope. If there's no Jesus, there is no hope. I offer you hope this morning. Free. It's hope for tomorrow. It's hope for the future. It's hope for eternity. But it is only found in Jesus. This great nation that I love. That I, I care enough about to vote. Some of you don't care enough about to vote. Shame on you. Go vote. But I care enough about to vote. But my hope is not in this great nation. Because I know Jesus. He is above the nation. So let's humble ourselves today. Let's call upon Him as our Lord and Savior, but let's call upon Him to bring America back. I, I want to make it great again, and I don't mean because I'm a Republican. I want to make it great again because I want to know Jesus, and I want America to experience another great awakening where people just stop work and start praying, where people gather and the Spirit of God just moves, where you can't get them in the church buildings. I can preach twice. <clears throat> I might even start preaching on Sunday nights. Hallelujah. And if we can't get them in three or four services on Sunday morning, come back on Sunday night. Amen? Amen. That'll work. But let's pray God, bring America back <coughs> again. Would you pray with me? For those of you who would like to come home, the altar's open. We encourage you to come home today. Repent. You see, it's a private place now, but if you don't repent, it'll become a public place and we'll all know it anyway. So just come and humble yourself. You may have a family member or a friend that's right on the edge, and if you don't pray for them, they may erupt. Judgment may come. The bear may destroy them. So God, thank you for making us a humble people here at Walter. For too many years we've been proud. Now we want to walk before you humbly, seek justice and love mercy. God, we want to pray for our family members and our friends. We want to pray for our church members and our friends. God, Please draw us home while there is time to repent. For we want to know you and really know peace. So help us to know you. If there's someone here who doesn't, help them come and share that with me or with Chris or with Michael or one of the deacons today so that we can pray with them to receive Christ. But Lord, this invitation is for home people to come home. And we make our prayer in the name of Jesus. Would you stand with us?
413. Any other words? I'd like to find the verse. No other name. 